Well, last week, Josh Cole looked at how a lot of opposition was beginning to mount against Nehemiah and the Jews as they were well into rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. The overall message from last week was, don't lose heart. The opposition arises, the persecution comes, the attacks may multiply, but we need to make sure that we do not lose heart, but we keep pressing on, we keep persevering, we keep fulfilling the things, the mandate that God has called us to fulfill. But sometimes the opposition grows to such an extent that we feel that there is no way we can do it alone. Sometimes the attacks become so frequent and so fierce that we feel we're just about to give up. We don't know if we can continue on any longer. It's in those times where we need a brother, a sister, a trusted friend to draw alongside of us and to help us fight the good fight. That's what we are seeing as we continue through this story of Nehemiah. As Nehemiah and the Jews were closing in on the completion of the walls, the opposition rose more and more fierce. The persecution became harder and harder. So let's take a closer look at this reading from today, from Nehemiah chapter 4, and let's see what it says to us to encourage us and to equip us so that we may fight the good fight. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 7 to 8 says, But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the work was going on ahead, that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. We see there that as Nehemiah was closing in on finishing this huge task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, the opposition grew more and more fierce, more angry, more hostile. We see that Sanballat and Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the men of Ashod, they began to plot together and join their forces in attacking Nehemiah and the Jews. Have you ever thought or have you ever noticed that Whenever we seek to step out in faith and being obedient to God's call, trying to do something special for God, that's when the opposition arises. When we try to embrace God's best and we try to remain faithful in our calling to follow God with all our heart, that's when the persecution arises. That's when the devil begins to attack harder and more regularly. It just seems to be the way it is. I remember a number of years ago hearing a preacher say, if you want to live a trouble-free life, if you want a life that's free of persecution, free from trial, free from opposition, then live an insignificant life. He said, if you, as, a, as a Christian, if you want to live a trouble-free, easy Christian life, then don't attempt to do anything significant for the Lord. Well, if that's how we can live trouble free, if that's how we can avoid persecution and trials and opposition, well, I'd say bring on the attacks because there is no way I want to live my life insignificantly. And I'd hope that you would agree that there is no way we want to live our Christian faith in insignificance. We want to do something special. We want to do something significant for the kingdom to the honour of our Saviour Jesus. Why did Jesus cop so much flack? Why did Jesus come under attack constantly? Why did the priests and the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even the Romans, why did they plot against him, seek to have him stoned, run out of town, discredited and eventually arrested and crucified? It was because Jesus was doing something significant for the kingdom of God. Jesus was rising up and he was fulfilling God's mandate, fulfilling God's purposes, doing something significant. As we live our life significantly for Jesus, the opposition will arise. So when that 
opposition does rise up, let's make sure that as believers, as a body, as the church, we stand together and we fight for one another. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired. There is so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Now, there's something to really take note of there where he says by ourselves. The task of rebuilding the wall was never about individuals. No one could complete such a task by themselves. It was about the whole teamwork of the people, the families, all the Jews working together under Nehemiah's guidance and leadership. It's similar for us. There's only so much that any individual person can endure. When the trials come, when the persecution come, when the opposition arises, there's only so much a person can do on their own before they feel that just, there's no way they can con- con- continue on. It might be rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. It might be volunteering in some area of ministry within the church. It might be raising your family. It might be leading a business, fighting against failing health, or just simply trying to live faithfully our Christian life in an increasingly hostile world. It's hard work. And that hard work can put a strain on us. We can become tired, weary, lacking the energy, not sure if we can continue to press on. That's when we really need someone to draw alongside us and give us their strength. One of the great stories of Moses is when Joshua went out to lead the Israelite army to fight the Amalekites. And Moses went up onto a hillside overlooking the battlefield And up there on the hillside, he raised his hands in worship to intercede for the Israelites. It's a story we've shared many times because it's actually the foundation of our pastor's prayer partner ministry. Let me read the story to you from Exodus chapter 17 from verses 8 to 13. The Amalekites came and attacked Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, They took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. When we are growing weak, when we're tired, exhausted, not sure if we can continue pressing on, in this task that is before us, when we feel like we're about to give up. That's when we all need an Aaron. That's when we all need a her to draw alongside us and give us their strength to stand with us in the fight. And when we see someone whose strength is failing them, when we see someone who potentially may give up, we need to be the one that draws alongside them and gives them our strength so that they may continue in the fight. Nehemiah 4, verses 11 and 12. It says, Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, Before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, They will come from all directions and attack us. The Jews were beginning to grow afraid because they kept hearing these threats from the enemy that the enemy was going to attack when they least expected them. They were just going to come out of nowhere and attack them and potentially defeat them. So they were becoming quite afraid. 
In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says this, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I'm sure we've all seen some of those gory nature documentaries where lions go charging in and kill the zebras and wildebeests and things like that. You learn a lot of things about a lion, something that a lion will not do. If there is a big herd of wildebeest having a drink at the water hole, a lion doesn't just walk right into the middle of the herd and loudly announce themselves as, hello, wildebeest, I'm a lion and I'm here to eat you. That's not the way that a lion works. Rather, when we watch those documentaries, we see that together in their uh, pack, the, the lions are hiding, they're prowling, they're surveying, they're watching very, very carefully that herd of wildebeest. They're sussing out, working out which one they're going to attack, which one is the most vulnerable. Is there a bit of a straggler that's wandering off from you know, the larger herd? They crouch down in the long grass, staying as completely out of sight as they can. Then all of a sudden, bang, they're out charging full bore at this herd. In panic, in fear, the herd of wildebeest scatters all over the place. They're confused. They don't know what's going on. The lions are then able to separate the herd. They pick out their target. They make their kill and they eat their fill. That's the way it seems to work. I think wildebeest are kind of dumb. I would think that if they were intelligent animals, what they would do is while the majority of the herd are drinking from the water hole, they would set up a few kind of lookouts. A couple of the bigger wildebeest might be continually looking out, watching for lions. As soon as they see something happening, they can say to the rest of the wildebeests, look out, fellas, there's a lion coming. Let's finish your drink. Let's move along. Let's move along. I think you know what I'm trying to say. The opposition will attack when we least expect it. And so we need someone to draw alongside us to help keep watch. We can fight for one another by keeping watch, by warning of potential attacks, by being there to keep watch for one another, particularly the weak or the vulnerable. Let's make sure that we fight for one another by keeping watch. Well, Nehemiah 4 verse 13, it continues on and says, So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears and bows. The wall was getting closer and closer to completion. But Nehemiah acknowledged and noticed that there were still certain areas of the wall that hadn't yet been rebuilt. There were low sections. There were still sections with gaps in them. And he saw and realised that those were areas that were weak. Those were areas that were vulnerable. So he made sure that he posted extra armed guards to those low areas, to those gaps, to those vulnerable sections. He made sure that there were armed guards standing by, standing in the gap. We need to make sure that we fight for one another by standing in the gap. The opposition will always look for weaknesses. The enemy will always look for points where we are most vulnerable. And in those weak areas, in that vulnerable areas, that's where he will attack. In our life, let's be honest, we all have areas of weakness. We all have areas where we are more vulnerable. Yes, we certainly all have strengths and great abilities that can be used for great things for the Lord. But if we're completely honest, we will acknowledge that we have areas of weakness, areas where we are more vulnerable. It might be in an area of failing health. It could be a, a character flaw that we struggle with. It might be a particular temptation that seems to trip us up time and time again. It might be one of those issues where it just seems to trigger us every time we're rubbed up the wrong way. But unfortunately, even when we may acknowledge and understand, yes, we do have some areas of weakness. We do have some areas where we are more vulnerable. We often try to hide it. We try to excuse it. We try to sweep it under the rug and pretend it's not there. And all that does is give the enemy 
an even greater advantage where he can attack us harder and more frequently. So what we need to do is to confess our weaknesses, confess that we do have areas of vulnerability. I don't mean getting up in front of the whole church and confessing all of our weaknesses to others, but rather we draw alongside us that trusted brother, that trusted sister, that wise Christian friend who can be there to stand in the gap. Not to judge, not to condemn, not to criticise, but to be there to help defend you, to help protect you, to stand in the gap so that we may fight together. A great verse from Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says, Two are better than one. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. In the battle of life that we are in the midst of every day, there are many times where we just feel we cannot do it alone. The enemy's attacks come, the opposition arises, our strength begins to fade. And we do worry, am I going to be able to keep on going? Can I continue to persevere? We feel like we're about to give up. That's when we need that brother, that sister, that wise Christian friend to draw alongside us and to help us fight the good fight. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 14. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. I'm certain that right now there are people watching this message today who need someone to draw alongside them to help them fight, to give them their strength, to stand in the gap and so on. Will you be that brother? Will you be that sister who will take that stand and in boldness of faith, in love for your brother and sister, that you will stand alongside them to defend them, to protect them and to help them stand firm in this fight to fight for one another when the opposition arises, to fight for one another when they are losing strength, to fight for one another by keeping watch and to fight for one another by standing in the gap. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, thank you again for this remarkable story of Nehemiah and for the many lessons that we've been gleaning from this story Continue to shape us and mould us by the power of your word, we pray, in Jesus' name. And Lord, as we fight on, as we fight the fight of faith, as we follow your call and your direction upon our life, and as that opposition arises, as the attacks come, I pray that we will stand firm in our faith and that we will fight the good fight. But Lord, we acknowledge, as we've seen through this story of Nehemiah, we cannot And you don't expect us, Lord, to do it on our own. We need one another. We need our brothers. We need our sisters. We need the body of Christ. But even all that, Lord, we continue to acknowledge that the battle is yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. And I pray that as we do fight together, as we stand together, that it will certainly be you who receives the honour and the glory as your light shines through our life. We love you and we thank you and we praise you, God Almighty. And it's in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.